It's supposed to be a movie showing camera explosion, but it's not working, so it doesn't matter. So um, uh, my board rate's going to drop by a factor of two. So I have half the number of slides for the second one. Um, what I want to do then is try to explain um, the Cambrian explosion, which is, um, I'll explain what that is in a moment, and then try to look at how one might explain it, but in the back of your minds, think about how one might explain any of the major transitions in the evolution of life. And so... Um, so, what's the Cambrian explosion? So we're now dealing exclusively with animals, so not plants, not fungi, not any of the other 24 plus independent origins of multicellularity. And the animal phyla, there are about 30 of them come in three flavors. The first one are the sponges, and the sponges have no organized tissues or organs. Some sponges, you can put them in a blender, and the cells will reassemble themselves into an adult again. So there are animals, but they are organized like most. Then there are a couple of phyla, um, jellyfish, corals, called diploblasts, and they're called diploblasts because they have two primary cell layers during embryogenesis, an inside and an outside, the ectoderm and the endoderm. And so those are those guys. And then all of the other phyla are called triploblasts. They have three primary cell layers. The inside, the ectoderm, makes the gut. The outside, the ectoderm, makes the outside. And the mesoderm makes things like um, heart, bone, a lot of the tissues. And so they're often called bilaterians because they tend to be bilaterally symmetrical. And so the Cambrian explosion is largely about the sudden appearance of the triploblastic phyla um, at the base of the Cambrian. And so here's just a bunch of triploblasts. Okay. So, naive expectation. This is from uh, Darwin's Origin of Species that Monty showed uh, yesterday. And so, you can just count diversity of lineages through time, two, etc. And if you measure a sort of disparity, a sort of the, the morphological difference, the phenotypic difference between things, so a jellyfish, a sea urchin, a human, there's only three species, but they're really disparate. But a 10,000 species of beetle all look like 10,000 species of beetles, so the disparity is really low. On this graph here, the way Darwin's drawn it, disparity just grows steadily as a function of time. So a naive ex expectation for the history of life prior to the fossil record would be that as time proceeds, species progressively become more and more different from each other. And maximum disparity should be now. So if we take the fundamental animal body plans, what we find is something quite different. So this is the present. This is the beginning of the Cambrian about 542 million years ago. This is <coughs> diversity of life in the oceans uh, measured from the fossil record. So there's the end Cretaceous mass extinction, for example. And what we find is the number of readily fossilized phyla basically emerge entirely within the Cambrian or slightly before with one exception. So the sudden appearance of the major body uh, organizations of animals occur during the Cayman explosion. So here's a diagram now I'm going to spend a little bit of time with. So here's the pre-Cambrian Cambrian boundary at 542, 543 million years ago. This is the Cambrian, so my diagram stopping here at 490 million years ago. So this is about, what, about 50 million years. And this is going down to about 590 million years. This is diversity as a function of time. So number of genera, a proxy for species. So it actually accelerates and then plateaus. So there's the acceleration and then plateauing. And then something else happens in the Ordovician, which I'm not going to talk about. And this is the number of classes within the phyla. So phyla mollusca has about, what is it, about eight or nine classes, the clams, the snails, the cephalopods, and a bunch of other things. And so that plateaus quite quickly, uh, rises and then plateaus quite quickly. So let's look at the fossil record of the precursor stages through the Cambrian explosion. So animal fossils start around 580 million years ago, as I said before, ignoring the biomarkers of sponges, and a spectacular uh, formation in China where there are fossil embryos. So early embryos have a hard uh, membrane around them that makes them preservable. They lose it quite quickly. Rudy Raff's shown this. 
really nicely. And of course, for the most part, you have no idea what they belong to because there's only a few cells there. So you can't tell what phylum they belong to, but they look like animal, uh, except for the baseball. I don't know what that's about. OK, so fossil embryos is really, really nice early on. And then, starting also at about 580, there is something called the Ediacaran biota, which is, again, named after an Australian locality, Ediacara in South Australia. We don't understand their biology very well, and so we don't know how to count classes and genera. And so here's just a slice of these things. This thing has been argued to be related to jellyfish. We don't know whether this is sort of, is that the front and the back, or is it stuck in the ground, dangling in the water column? Don't know. This thing, it looks like it's got a frontish and a backish and some sort of seriation. The segments, if that's what they are, seem to be slightly off, out of phase with each other, which is kind of interesting. And so they could be early animals. They could be giant protists, single-cell eukaryotes with multi multinucleate. They could be an independent invention of multicellularity that's gone extinct. Some people have claimed that there are lichens. Some have argued that there are fungi. We don't really know. And so when I've been thinking about the Cambrian explosion, I have in the back of my mind the fact that I'm not going to work out what these things are. Most paleontologists don't feel they can proceed until they identify what the taxa are, which has sort of frozen that for quite some time. So Ediacara and ecosystems look like they consist of fairly simple filter feeders living off the embryonic stages of these things. And it also looks like there were extensive bacterial mats on the substrate on the bottom. And the, the sediments at that time have this classic thing called elephant hide texture. It looks like this. It's stiff. The bacteria have glued it together. Okay, so that's the Ediacara and Boda, Biota. And pretty much they go extinct at the Precambrian-Cambrian boundary. So the next to appear, and this is really, really important, are trace fossils which is tracks and trails of organisms. And that starts at about 555 million years ago. And initially, they're only horizontal. And then precisely at the Precambrian-Cambrian boundary, they go vertical. And the argument is, the argument is that you can't burrow unless you have a coelom. And the only things that have coeloms are the triploblasts. So the argument is, that this thing must indicate the origin of uh, triploblastic animals. And that this thing need, may have had a coelom, it may not have had a coelom. So even though we can't tell the identity of the organisms, the trace fossil record gives us some indication of what the underlying biology was like. And so this is uh, the first occurrence of, this is a bedding plane of rock. And it looks like it's going down and up and down and up and down and up. So penetrating backwards and forwards. And if you slice it through, you can see that. And this is Soren Jensen, uh, working in Spain now, but from Sweden, um, who's the world's best at interpreting these things. Now, I made a strange statement. I said, um, this occurs precisely at the Precambrian-Cambrian boundary, which is kind of a, a dramatic claim for a fossil record that's really rich. And the reason why I can say precisely is because the first appearance of this fossil in Newfoundland defines the base of the Cambrian. <laughs> <laughs> and then someone probably found an older one in South Australia, so it's kind of annoying. Um, OK, so it's really interesting. So it's penetrating the sediment for the first time about 542 million years ago. And then slightly later, we start to get the first skeletonized fossils. So these things are not skeletonized. They're stiff, but they have no skeletons. And so I'm not going to show you, f due to time, the first lightly biomineralized ones, but I'm going to show you the small shelly fossils. So these are the small shelly fossils, and they're called that because they're small, and they're shelly, and they're fossils, <laughs> which is a fancy way of saying we really don't know who they belong to. Except the thought is that some of them probably are parts of much larger organisms. These are often typically you know, 200 microns across or something. And some fossils have been found with them all knit together in some sort of armored worms. Um, OK, so that gets us now into the early Cambrian. And then we have something called the Cheng Jiang biota. I apologize for the pronunciation. And the first body fossils are things like trilobites. So at some distance into the Cambrian, and then slightly later, we have the Burgess Shale. Who's heard of the Burgess Shale? Right. So the Burgess Shale biota is sitting here at about 510 or so. It's really not properly dated yet. 
And from my point of view, the Burgess Shale is really in the warm afterglow of the Cambrian explosion. The phyla are apparent. The classes that are going to originate in the Cambrian have originated. Diversity has plateaued. So we're seeing the stable world in the marine realm after the Cambrian explosion. And so here's a beautiful book you can buy uh, with the Chen Jiang fossils and it's incredible stuff. I think it's 17 phyla now, 100 plus animal species, spectacular preservation from things like trilobites, the first chordates, uh, sponges, all sorts of things, incredible stuff. Um, and then there's the famous Burgess Shale, where the preservation is as spectacular, but it's gray on gray, which makes it harder to look at. So the famous Opabinia with five eyes and a trunk. Lots of morellas with gut content squished out. Um, so found up here by Walcott. And things we don't know quite what they are. Hallucigenia, named by Simon Conway Morris, based on something that he saw while taking a substance that has DS and L in it. <laughs> Yeah, that's right, if you're a bit dyslexia, dyslexic. <laughs> so, um, so here's a reconstruction of that Burgess Shale biota. It's interesting, the ratio of soft-bodied to skeletonized taxa is about the same as in modern marine environments, which is interesting. So we think we've got most of the species, which is really pretty nice. Um, so a foil for this lecture, I'm going to pick on the deceased Steve Gould. So Gould emphasized the weirdness of these fossils. He hinted that a special genetic mechanism might be at work to create the phyla. And he argues in his book, you know, A Wonderful Life, if we could rerun the tape of life, we would see an utterly different biota from today's. And I'm going to argue that these things are almost certainly not true. But that's my foil, and he isn't here to defend himself. So there's hallucinogenia, a failed early experiment with Steve's argument. There's the reconstruction. Uh, turns out um, that... It's got structures that look like they're homologues with something found in Chen Jiang. And so it looks like uh, Simon Con Morris got the damn thing upside down. <laughs> Walking on spines doesn't make much sense. <laughs> and they missed a row of these thingos. And so it looks like it's an onychophron, which is a basal arthropod. And so most of the problematic fossils have been assigned, I think, fairly comfortably to existing phyla. There are a few that still stand out, but it isn't 20 or 30, the way Steve Gould argued. It's just one or two or three out of 30. So they're not that weird. But a lot of them are what we call stem groups. Archaeopteryx is a bird, but it's got a long tail, it's got teeth, it's got claws on its fingers. A lot of these things belong to existing phyla, but they don't fit into the current living groups. So they are intermediate in that sense. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to simplify this and talk now as if there's no anatomy, there's sort of a a pre-Cambrian explosion time and a post time, just for convenience. But there really is an anatomy, an unfolding of the event. And I like to argue that you wouldn't call it a Cambrian explosion if we were sentient clams, say, living 490 million years ago. Because most of our fossil record would be dominated by the change. And so I think we'd call it, rather than the Cambrian explosion, we would call it the great unfolding. <laughs> right? And so that anatomy is in order 10 million years, which is fairly interesting. So again, Burgess, Shale, trilobites with the soft appendages preserved. So what needs explaining? The literature is complex in part because people haven't dissected out the different things. There's the increase in disparity, the animal phyla. There's the increase in diversity. There's the time of onset. Why did it occur roughly half a billion years ago? Why not two billion years ago? Why not 10 million years ago? Why is the duration order 10 million years, not 1 million years, or why 100 million years? In fact, general, why is it that I can trace major transitions in the fossil record? If evolution went 10 or 100 times faster, I wouldn't see it. Mammals would just appear, life would have invaded land. If it was much slower, then I wouldn't have many of them. So I think it's incredibly interesting, that, that time scale. And why is the explosion unique? Causes of the explosion. Um, environmental changes are often posited. Increased oxygen is thought to have played a, a necessary but not sufficient role. To be an animal, you've got to have reasonable levels of oxygen, and it looks like oxygen may have started to jump up about 600 million years ago, maybe tied to the snowball Earths. So I suspect that's necessary but not sufficient. But maybe that's what sets, it occurred half a billion years ago. If oxygen had jumped up a billion years earlier, we might have had some, and it came an explosion. Development, you can't make animals until you have the genes for making animals. And so clearly new developmental system has to be developed. And then things like ecology, and I'm going to, in the, well, you'll see what I'm going to do.
So almost to play a role, what's the interplay between the factors? So Jim Valentine is here, has argued for an ecological view, and what he has is sort of arbitrary niches where each square represents a novel, a, a new way of being. And then what he does, he has a jump size where genetically it's hard to produce new phyla, but relatively easy to produce new species or genera. And then what he says is the surrounding niche space must be free for large jumps to succeed. So it's hard for a new bird to come into existence if there are lots of birds already around. Um, and so then what he does, I'm just simulating it here, so, you know, small jumps, there's a big jump with a new phylum, some oh, new class, another new class, mostly new genera. And then here's a big jump that should be a new phylum, but it's already got competitors ecologically, so it doesn't take. And so if you run this a little bit further, there's two phyla each with two classes, and most of the ecological space is filled. Now, at the end, Permian, a quarter of a billion years ago, about 96, 98% of all species in the marine realm went extinct. But we don't see new phyla, don't even see much of the way new classes. And the argument is, even though diversity has plummeted, most of the major ecological types are still there. There are some sharks, there are some still sea urchins, there are still things. So this is the argument that ecological incumbency limits innovation. So developmental genetics, origin of new developmental system was responsible for the Cambrian explosion, morphologically simple, morphologically complex. Development of the uh, origin of the new genes there is responsible. How can we know what the developmental capacity of the last common ancestor of all the, say, triploblasts were? Well, you can take a fish genome and you can take a fly genome and you can look for genes in common. And it turns out that any gene in common turns out to be in the last common ancestor of all the triploblasts. So phytogenetic analysis of model systems means we can actually make a fairly good guess as to what the set of genes were at the time of the origin of the triploblasts. And that's enormously valuable because we don't have any fossils from most of these lineages here, so we're really stuck. So comparative genomics has made an enormous difference to this discipline. So what are the genes? Are the Hox genes? So just remind you, things like Holtairs. Um, here on the third thoracic segment, and if you take this gene ultra by thorax and you knock it out, you get a Nobel Prize. Um, you get a fly, instead of having two wings in the halt airs, you get four wings. So presumably most of you have heard of this. But it shows you a little bit of development, right? The way development operates. What's happened is by knocking out ultra by thorax, you've changed the identity of the third thoracic segment to the identity of the second which is really interesting. Uh, so you haven't actually changed wings and halt airs into wings at all. Um, and so those are ubiquitous across all the animals. Vertebrates are weird because we've had two genome duplications since we diverged. And then things like, um, you know, eyeless, you know, you express the gene in the right place, you can get eyes instead of antennae, or an eye on a wing, or eye on a leg, or eye on another antenna. So just, and it turns out that, you know, to me this is staggering, this, this next result, is eyeless turns out to have homologs across all the phyla. And so I think this, this incredible result here, you can take the mouse homolog or one of them and stick it in a fly, and the fly recognizes it and builds an eye. And to me that's unbelievable, right? Because there's a, at least a billion years of evolution, a billion years of evolution. 500 down the fly lineage and 500 up the, the chordate, the vertebrate lineage. And yet the amino acid sequence is so conserved that the Drosophila can recognize it and switch on the genes responsible for making eyes. Um, and so I think we'll see the stabilizing selection is a dominant feature of a lot of animal evolution. And I think that's a really good example of that. I know, I mean, I th I'm sure they do. Um, so there are a whole bunch of genes in common. The Hox genes for anterior pas posterior patterning. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah. The, that gene's involved in, in mollusks, vertebrates. Yeah, the PAC6 is involved, yeah, yes, in that sense, yes. It's, it's involved in initiating, initiating development of the eye. But the eyes are completely different, of course. But they're initiating, which says the last common ancestor had a photo re photoreceptor. And that photoreceptor is turned on by PAC6 or eyeless. Yeah, sorry, I misunderstood. I thought you were asking what the mutant phenotypes look like. Uh, so, um, so the genes for dorsal ventral, so there's genes for making the Cartesian coordinates of the animal body plane. 
So in development, you've got to create the space. So you create the space with the Hox genes, dorsal ventral, left, right, and then regionalizing it, regionalizing the nervous system, regionalizing the gut, growing things out or in, distillus, photoreception, PAC-6. Tin man, tin man does what? Anybody know? Makes you a heart, right? So Drosophila people have a sense of humor, right? Wizard of Oz had no heart, tin man. Um, okay, so that's sort of some of the toolkit. So it suggests that all those genes lie between here and here, uh, which makes sense. What I'm going to argue is I don't think it's true. And so that's what I'm going to do now. So this is a phrase, principle of frustration. I've sort of taken it from Stuart Kaufman, who's told it from the spin glass people. You've got you know, a lattice with something spin up and something spin down, and you put one in the middle. It doesn't know which way to, which way to spin. So the same idea is that different ecological needs will often have partially conflicting solutions so that the overall optimal design of an organism will rarely be optimal for any of the specific tasks it needs to perform. There are trade-offs. But I say that I think trade-offs is critical to understanding the Cambridge explosion and innovation. And so now one of the nice things is I'm going to jump from the fossil record to computer simulation. And the virtue of computer simulation is you can explore the entire phase space rather than having just one realization of the process, what we see today in the fossil record. And so what Carl Nicholas did um, at uh, Cornell a long time ago is developed a, a six morphogenetic rule system for plants. So there's probably a probability of branching on the left and the right. And then there's the angles that those branches emerge. And then these dots here are the tops of these branches here. So then there's the angles in this direction. So probability of branching and then the angles and then the angles. So it's six developmental rules, really, really simple. So then you can perform evolution on it, variation followed by selection. You can change the values of these a little bit, make a new plant, and then ask how well does that plant perform given tasks. So here's a three-dimensional representation of that 6D space. He picked parameter values that gave the morphology of Cooksonia that I showed last lecture and then varied that a little bit, increasing the branching probabilities, and then wandered it through until it settled down on an optimum. So the so nice... I'll do it now. And so the nice thing is you can actually quantitatively write down what's being optimized so you can actually measure fitness. So the first thing he optimized was reproductive success. Seeds occur on the ends of branches, and so reproductive success has two components, which is the number of branch tips, and then he also has the dispersal component to it. The higher the branches, the better dispersal. And so it produces one optimal solution that looks like an upside down broom and not much like a plant. So then he did it again, starting with Cooksonia. So this guy here sees and said, let's do it for light interception. Sun rises and it sets. And so you just look at the maximum light interception. If there's multiple tiers, you want to avoid overshadowing three optimal solutions. And some of them look like plants. And the last thing he did is he optimized mechanical stability. Long branches had better be vertical. If they're horizontal, they'll break off, and that is a bad thing. Okay, so then the question, so then evolution under simple selective regimes, few opta, optima, simple morphologies. So then he said, what happens now if I select for all three simultaneously? And now trade-offs, frustration sets in. I can't both be optimal for reproductive success and for light interception. And so when you select for three simultaneously, seven solutions with more complex morphologies. And then what he did is he added in a fourth need, minimizing surface area. Desiccation is a problem for anything that lives on land. So that's minimizing surface area. And now there are about 20 or 21 optimal solutions. Now the thing that I found staggering about this is there is no fundamental change in the developmental program. None. Zero. Zip. It's got the same six rules, but as you increase the number of selective pressures, the number of optimal solutions and their complexity goes up. So to me the Cambridge explosion is not about fundamentally the invention of the, of the bioterian developmental system. It's about the capacity to extract the combinatorial potential out of that system, and you can only do that ecologically. And I like to skate out on thin ice and therefore make errors.
fact, Michael Nuckman in the audience pointed out my uh, argument for the lunar cycle still in females is sort of bogus because uh, in most female mammals it isn't even vaguely a month, like mice it's three days, etc. So, uh, okay. Most of these morphologies appear in the fossil record by the end of the Devonian, when the first forests emerge. So at some really simple level with six developmental rules and four selective pressures, Nicholas has been able to mimic plant evolution as we see in the fossil record. Now there's no leaves, there's no roots, there's no flowers, there's no reproductive organs. But that's a staggering result. So the way I've been thinking about this is in terms of fitness landscapes, which uh, Monty talked about as well yesterday. So these are the developmental rules. This is just two out of the six. So to my mind, this captures sort of the variation part of Darwin's evolution. Each point corresponds to a specific morphology, so a population will have a range of morphologies. And then I've left the z-axis for fitness, the probability of survival. So this is sort of the variation followed by selection, the Darwinian two-step. So here I can pick up that. And so any given morphology in a given environment will have a specific fitness. And so you can map out all of them and you get a fitness landscape. Um, and so then you've got the number of optima that you expect to see on the fitness landscape. And so the fitness landscape roughens as the number of frustrated needs increases. And I've dropped the height to the peak here because the trade-offs means in an absolute sense the fitness has dropped if that has any meaning since the environment is different. Um, so expect diversity and disparity to increase as evolution explores the landscape. So one thing which I think is a huge challenge and a possible critique of this approach is there's, a, again, a, a morphogenetic fitness landscape. So it's not a Wrightian landscape, which is allelic. It's based on the morphogenetic rules. So there's genes and there are alleles, and the genes are organized into gene networks, and those gene networks conspire to produce sort of a capacity to produce morphology. And so I think one of the big challenges is trying to work out how to go from this wealth of information in here to understanding the relatively few morphogenetic rules that I think are responsible for organizing either plants or animals or fungi, etc. So the dimensionality drops as you go up in this direction, which has bearing on Gavrilet's arguments for holy fitness landscapes. Um, it makes understanding how one moves from genotypic space into morphogenetic space difficult, as Lewinton has pointed out as early as 1974. Um, but I think the morphogenetic rules is the thing that really matters because it's the morphology that the selection is operating on. So now we come back to the Ediacarans. And okay. so, sorry? So, uh, but you, the, the mutations happen to the genes. So yeah. there could be tons of peaks out there that are really far away genetically, so they're irrelevant. Yeah, I mean, it's the, the mapping is hard, how you move. Um, and there's, there are lots of aspects of the phenotype, so. So now coming back to the Cambridge explosion, having sort of set that up. And so one thing that struck me about these things is no one knows what they are. Um, as you know, Darwin did really well not knowing the nature of the hereditary material. So the question is, can I make some progress in understanding the Cambridge explosion without knowing what these things are biologically? And I must confess, I don't find these very interesting. And the reason why I don't find them very interesting is that I'm sort of a complexity addict. So vertebrate skeletons, full rig sailing ships, chess. And these things just aren't particularly complex. They don't have any knobs and bobs on them. And then it suddenly occurred to me they don't have any knobs and bobs on them. Animals today are defined by their knobs and bobs. Evolution read in tooth and claw. No teeth, no claws, no macroscopic sense organs, no antennae, no seti. There are no organs of interaction on these things for thing with, to interact with things of a similar size. There are no bite marks, there's no claws, there's no armor. They basically lack organs of interaction. And so I think what's happening then is that these things, if we look at the phylogenetic distribution of developmental genes, have the genes that basically um, are shared between all living phyla today, but they don't have the morphology. And so I think what happens for the across the Cambrian explosion transition is we start to invent adult body, adult body ecology. And I don't know how that happens, but basically there are all these beefsteaks sitting on the seafloor and somebody works out that they're food. And then the arms race begins. And I just want to remind you that biological interactions are vast in ecosystems. So this is a food web from one lake in Wisconsin. This is a simplified food web of the North Atlantic. 
Now, I think as Homo sapiens, we've made ourselves largely immune to most of these interactions. So I don't think we realize just how many selective pressures most species actually um, have most of the time. And so I think what happens then, here's the Nicholas equivalent, and here's the Cambridge explosion equivalent, simple morphologies for simple needs. And then you increase the number of selective pressures by ecological interaction, the landscape roughens, and you go from Ediacaran times to Cambrian times. So how does one test this? So one test is to dive into the genomic data. And so let's do that a little bit. So this is an interesting graph from Tauts's group in Germany. Well, what he has is the phylogenetic time of origin of Drosophila melanogaster genes. So this is the present as she goes down the tree. And so what you can see here, he's, sorry, yeah. Yeah. So each species is competing with itself as well. Yes. So how can we, we assume, I mean, so, so there's this assumption that uh, there is no competition between them, there's no armor, there's no claws, there's no... Well, if, if, you, if, if you don't have any organs to, if you don't have any claws or jaws or biting parts, then you can't eat your fellow species. Yes, the bacterial maps. Yes, there's still competition. There's still ecology. They're still feeding on the bacterial maps. They're still sucking out larval forms out of the water column. Yeah. So there's still ecology going on, but they're not interacting with. Oh, so they're interacting indirectly, but they're not. They're not predating on each other. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, how does your whole picture of the you know morphogenetic rules sort of you know encompass that? Because so what it tells me, so let's go here, so let's do this diagram here. So, so one thing that's always bothered me a little bit with sort of the Sean Carroll approach to this, the key gene approach, is that you only find conserved genes if they're conserved. You don't know whether there's a whole bunch of genes that are not conserved, that are phylum specific. And so this is a whole genome approach. So let's have a look at Drosophilus, all of Drosophila genes, and ask where on the tree of life did they originate. And what's been left off here is the huge number of genes that occur in the last common ancestor of all cellular organisms, the ribosomal RNA is the elongation factors, etc., the tRNAs. And so on this tree here, this is when the phylum arthropoda is established. And what you can see that in Drosophila, there are not many genes that date to this particular time, which tells you that there are virtually no arthropod specific genes. So when I was an undergraduate, we were very much built that each phylum has a fundamentally different body plan and therefore had a fundamentally different set of genes. And then the Cambrian explosion is really hard to explain because you've got to 30 times invent a unique set of genes independently. But here, the peak in innovation is at about the Bidaterian stage or the Eumetazoan stage, which includes the jellyfish and the corals. So there's a big burst of innovation starting at the sponges through the jellyfish stage. And then it looks like, given that genomic potential, then they differentiate into the phyla. So massive pre-adaptation in the genome. Now, one thing that occurs to me about this in terms of gene genic evolution in here is that even unicellular organisms like coanoflagellates live in a multicellular world, right? They've got to find mates. They've got to avoid predators. They've got to find food. So all the um, signal transduction pathways, et cetera, need to be in place already so that I can work out how to modify my cytoskeletons so I can decide whether to reproduce or ingest something or to run away. So a lot of the key genes that occur in us obligate metazoans evolved in non-obligate eukaryotes because they're still in a multicellular world. They just ob aren't obligately so. Um, so I think then, so, so this then supports the argument that there's a developmental system that does not express morphological complexity yet because it wasn't challenged to do so yet. Yeah. It still looks like there was an explosion of developmental degeneration at some point. Yeah, and it does seem to be sitting in here. Yeah, it's a good question. And so I don't know enough about, so it has to happen in the world of protists, most, for the most part, or the beginning of multicellular organisms, so there is a burst. The other issue with this diagram, which is tough, is you work out where you are by finding the gene in other taxa, 
And so we haven't sampled the genomes of protists all that well. So as we do so, some of these genes may finish up appearing earlier than that. So there's a selection bias a little bit in the sense that we haven't, you know, the, this is the fungi plant split. This is the eukaryotic split. So there's no dissection on that part of the tree of life. To me, most, I don't know, gene duplication strikes me as being particularly important for the innovation of new genes. Uh, I don't know, partial gene conversion does it. Uh, mutation, I don't think, can't do it because it's just too slow. Most genes are, aren't separated by each other by just a few mutations, right, by a few amino acids. Okay, so then I think the developmental system originates here, and the Cambrian explosion was driven by the onset of adult, uh, adult adult ecological interactions with a concomitant increase in the number of frustrated needs. So environmental conditions had to be in place. Question? Yeah. With respect to the touts graph, how, I listened carefully, but how do, how do we know there wasn't just a bunch of, of organisms already out there in that earlier period, besides the Idiocara, that, that just haven't left any fossils? Yeah, so you get this nasty problem how do we know that there aren't a whole bunch of myofaunal, you know, 20, 30, 50 micron organism level triple blasts out there in the water column? Yeah. Well, or, or just soft, very soft things that don't leave any... Yeah, like, like a lot of phyla. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the answer is we don't, is the bottom line. So you concentrate on the skeletonized things or the, the tiff, tough things. Molecular clocks tend to give rough concordance to these time frames, which include obviously the soft body things that live today. The trace fossil record is fairly important because, you know, there's not, before 555 million years, there are no traces, <coughs> none. So if 800 million years ago there were 30 phyla, but they were microscopic, then some of them you would think would have worked out how to disturb the sediment. Mm -hmm. Unless the sediment really was anoxic, for example, which is possible. Some of there's, you know, oxygen in the upper water column, but not on the bottom and nothing could get down there. So I can't rule out the possibility that these things are much deeper in time. Uh, but that's where the trace fossils become strangely important, even though we have no idea what the hell made them in detail. Okay, so um, just wrapping up. The developmental system must have been evolved in at least rudimentary form. And there's the, the evolution of behaviors and morphologies of ecological interaction that the latent potential for morphological innovation in the genome was released. And that gives the suddenness. But it still takes roughly 10 million years. But evolution of vertebrate invasion of land took about that long. The radiation of mammals after the end Cretaceous takes about that long. So it seems to take about 10 million years for major evolution radiations to occur. So the approach is unashamedly ecological and adaptationist in nature. And I put that up because I grew up at a stage when Gould and Lewinton basically said you couldn't say this. So it's taken me a while to shed that part of my training. No new genetic mechanism is required to explain the Cayman explosion. It suggests if we were to rerun the history of life, we might get morphological forms not all that different from what we see in the fossil record. So to my mind, I view evolution as an engineering problem. I've got some construction rules. I've got a set of tasks that those rules have to make an organism to satisfy. And there will be a set of solutions. And evolution solves the NP-hard problem exploring that fitness landscape circa 10 million years. Variation is like the jumping rule. Selection is like the acceptance rule. And so it just, so that's, and I'm going to get bashed here, so I'll, I've, I've finished. Why, 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 why isn't that, you feel that the mammals didn't arise much earlier? So let me go somewhere slightly different. It turns out that there are f me f mechanically four ways of being a carnivore if you're a large vertebrate. You can f be a hypercarnivore eating solely meat. You can be a bone cracker like a hyena. You can be an omnivore like a dog where the molar has both a cutting blade and a, uh, and a grinding surface. Or you can be like a bear that only has grinding surfaces. So in the dentition, one of those four engineering solutions. It turns out that today the hypercarnivores are the big cats, lions, tigers, cheetahs. Go back 20 million years ago, the hypercarnivores were a dog group. Go back 40 million years, it was a different dog group. 
So from an eco-morphological eco point of view, hypercarnivory has evolved three times, twice in dogs and once in, in, in the carnivores. So if you don't get too tied up with the clay, mammal, reptile, amphibian, but you look at the eco-morphology, these things do appear multiple times. Rosa. So even though there are fewer genes invented during the, the Cambrian period, uh, I mean, it would still be possible that those genes were somehow more important in terms of regulatory functions. Well, uh, so I think most of the genes involved are regu regulatory genes. I don't think there's that many more genes. I mean, the, the vertebrate chordate genomes got duplicated twice, so there's, there's, there's more genes now than there was in that sense. But I don't think that there's been a huge change in gene numbers since the Cambrian explosion. <laughs> And most of the genes that are important are going to be regulatory genes. Right. Uh, but so, not all factory. So I guess that's sort of maybe a pushback against your second point here. Right? I mean, it's still possible that it's, there were important regulatory innovations that were needed during the Cambrian period to allow for the, the, no, to Well, it's possible, it's possible it's true. Commentorial explosion. But in some respects, if it's a commentorial explosion, then you could argue that that innovation has to occur before the fighter diverge from each other because they all share that same innovation, whatever it is. So, you know, the, the invention of using microRNAs to sort of really refine morphological expression. So it doesn't, it doesn't exclude the possibility. It doesn't say it's not required. It might have happened. And that, and that is, is still tricky. Um, I think what happens is we get fooled by the fact that the animal fire by eye look utterly non-commensurate, a jellyfish, a sea urchin, and us. But genetically, they're quite commensurate, but they're basically different variations of a theme. And that's all, that's all I'm saying. <coughs> there and there. Oh, there, there's one, two, three. Steve. Well, what, what's out? Yeah. yeah. So um, you say this is sort of um, unashamedly ecological, but then, you know, you, the, the thing that you're talking about with the morphogenesis and yeah. the um, development of, of, of plants. I mean, none of your rules there involve ecology, right? I mean, right. So, so I guess what I'm saying. So, what, I, what I'm saying is that so Steve Gould and Lewinton, the sand, right. spandrels of San Marco, and the yeah. what is it, the what is it, the poverty of the adaptationist program or something. Um, basically, at least in paleontology, you couldn't even use the word adaptation uh, for about a decade and a half at, at our nationals and meetings and things like that. But variation is a two-step uh, evolution is a two-step pro process. There's variation. And then this selection, and I like a modification of Van Valen's characterization of that, which is the filtering of, e of development by ecology. Development's the variation part. Ecology is the arena within which selection occurs. So I view Darwinian evolution as the filtering of development by ecology. So there's innovation at the developmental level, and there's a develop set of de developmental rules, and then there's the ecological part. And so this is unashamedly ecological and adaptationist, but obviously the morphogenetic space is the development part of it. It's just that I'm questioning the usefulness of the whole fitness landscape idea since ah. it doesn't actually say anything about ecology, right? Because it's just this sort of idea, you know, you sort of need to know what's out there competing with you and predating on you to know, you know, what... The, the sort of landscape is so it's well, so, this so, kind of static landscape. So I've, got a, so I've got a right. So I've got a paper in press which is specifically on the evolution of fitness landscapes, and so the problem is that Sue are right and most people have a static fitness landscape, yeah. and my feeling is for the most part they are not static. Yeah. And Gavrilets yeah. has got this ridiculous thing where you know his, part of his justification is that you can't go between peaks. Well, it's ridiculous because, in my opinion, what happens is that the damn peaks move, yeah. carrying the populations with them. So you don't actually have to have morphological transformations by going into fitness valleys. You can just move to the peaks if you can keep up with it. So then what happens is what are the modes of fitness landscape evolution? One of them, you can increase the density of peaks. That's ecological. You can add new morphogenetic rules. That's developmental. You can take a given rule and add more variants. So the ADB, ABC system for plant uh, uh, flower morphogenesis, different angiosperms have different B genes, so you increase the possibilities. Another one is you can just move the peaks around. That's going to be an ecological change. So the invasion of birds into the air or whales into the water has no fundamental genetic innovation at all. The change in environment changes the peaks. So I think when you think about the, the ways in which the landscapes can evolve, you can start to identify, given specific examples, when ecology matters, when development matters.
So I don't know whether that's useful or not, but that's where I've been sort of going with, which is I didn't include. You have ridges. Sorry? You have ridges, not only peaks, but you have ridges going along these. So the peaks, the valleys are not that deep as they seem to be. Yes, right. Though, you know, one thing that really strikes me in the fossil record, and, and again, Monty talked about it um, yesterday, is that stasis um, is pretty common in the fossil record which tells me that things aren't moving through the ridges to other peaks very often. So the peaks, peaks are real. And so then it matters what the scaling is of the ridges. And I don't know what that scaling looks like, but I think most of the time it's effectively a valley. So, um, yeah, it's getting... Yeah, what type? <coughs> uh, so can you go to 11? thinking about the physics landscape is, from a game theoretic perspective, that's, that's um, Organisms change each other's Yeah. Space. So, all right, so I model co evolution. That's exactly right. Right. So you get escalation, bigger claws, that's movement in space, means <coughs> bigger shells, my mean, shells that moving in their space. So, so co evolution, or evolution escalation will be sort of co movement of, of peaks. So I'm not sure how useful it is, but I think as a, I'm really a morphologist. And so, um, you know, the problem I have with Sewell Wright types landscapes or, or Kaufman stuff or Gavrilets is it never actively engages the phenotype or the specifics of it. Just reduces everything down to our fitness, which is, you know, and, that, and that's not very useful to me as a paleontology and a morphologist. So that's where I'm coming from. That's my, my prejudice. We have one last question. Oh. Yeah, um, yeah, sorry. May I go back to something you mentioned in the previous talk, what you ended with, where you said that uh, the beginning of life was easy that the rest of it is what, where the hard part comes in. So can, can you try to reconcile that to the usual new one, or at least that I've heard, uh, you know, it, the evolution of DNA, you know, how you get started, it was the hard part, and then, then of course, you can, you can imagine going on from there. So, it's, it's the, so the, way, the way I think about it is in terms of waiting times. Charles, can you yeah. the question? So the question is, it sounds, it's, the question, the, the statement is that I'm sort of reversing the, the normal sense, where the really hard part is to polymerize things like DNA and RNA and make life in the first instance. And then once you've done that, it seems fairly easy to get the rest of the stuff. And I seem to be saying the reverse, that actually getting life started is pretty simple, but getting something like Homo sapiens is really, really hard. Um, and so the way I think about it is in terms of waiting times, basically. And so the waiting time from when life could have originated on Earth, the end of the heavy bombardment, and when it did, looks like it's fairly short, 10, 100 million years, relatively short. Where the waiting time once you've got life to the emergence of, say, the capacity to make telescopes is 4 billion years. And even in the Cambrian explosion, which takes, well, that takes four, you know, three and a half billion years to get to the Cambrian explosion, I can't even sniff yet the invasion of land, let alone primates, let alone humans. So it looks like there are these hard thresholds to cross that take enormous parts of geologic time. Now maybe what happens is that it's actually really easy, it's just you've got to get the right boundary conditions and then the transition is simple. So that's the other alternative. Incredibly long waiting times of nothing happening and then the change in the boundary conditions and then it happens very quickly. And so origin of sentience doesn't seem to be quite like one of those. So, so, that's, so that's the dilemma, and I don't know how to answer that problem. And it comes back again, Monty again outlined in his talk, you know, to what extent is evolution fundamentally sort of dependent upon the availability of the right variation? Uh, but we have to invent so many levels of control before you get to us. And I think the invention of control is the hard thing. You know, regulate cells, you've got to make a eukaryotic, eukaryotic cell with a cytoskeleton, mitochondria. If you have the mitochondria, you've got the energy source, so you're screwed. So how long does that take? And then you've got to get, to get obligate metazoans, and that seems like a bad thing rather than a good thing, so how long does that take? And then the cells have to learn to talk to each other so that they actually can produce hundreds or thousands or millions of cell lengths the way something different. That's really quite staggering, right? You know, that, you know, my part of my liver, it has no idea that a bone's developing there, there are neurons developing there, so you've got to develop that system. Um, sorry, uh, I, I, okay, we have to start now. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>